Well, wait, is this really a chemical? Yes, it is. <laughs> Good answer. Yes. And to answer that with more depth, with more detail, chemicals are liquids, they are solids, they are gases, they are vapors, they are fumes, they are mists. And we mentioned earlier, a chemical spill can include simply a mixing of two chemicals that were not compatible, and you get a volatile gas. We will call that a chemical spill. And, um, and we talked about how to react to those, how to evacuate without um, creating a spark. Um, so, and according to Washington State and the federal EPA record uh, requirements and standards on dangerous and hazardous waste, a solid waste is pretty much any waste that doesn't belong down the drain. So even if it is a chemical liquid, if it is a hazardous chemical, it is a solid waste. And um, it needs to be uh, handled appropriately and needs to be disposed appropriately. So what does not go down the drain? Number one. Grab some toilet paper, it's the only trash this takes. Number two, a singular material that won't cause sewers to break. Tissue that comes on the rolls, the only high to choose. The only paper you can flush away with number ones and twos. Anything that isn't toilet paper or human waste clogs your sewers. Avoid costly visits from a plumber while also protecting our beautiful Puget Sound. Keep trash and wipes of all kinds out of the toilet. Toilet paper and our human waste. Nothing else, not even in our haste. Flush, flush, flush. Just flush is one. Visit FlushingAwesome.com to learn what you shouldn't flush away. Brought to you by King County. Oh, don't flush chemicals down the drain. Other things that don't belong down the drain are tampons or condoms. Actually, in 2018, Kings County's Wastewater Treatment Division spent over $120,000 just to take wipes, tampons, and trash and debris out of their wastewater treatment plants and send that to the wet landfill. That's actually two semi-truck loads of trash that they're sending to the landfill from the drain every week. If you want to complain about the expense of your utility bills, here's a reason they're so expensive. What also does not be dying down the drain? Do not flush medications or chemicals. All chemicals must be reviewed by the environmental health and safety manager, that's myself, before you're permitted to dump that down the drain. Uh, when in doubt, ask about. Uh, ex my extension is 5522. Reach out, please, I'm here for you. Do not flush hypodermic needles. Um, do not flush any materials uh, that would be but that would require bloodborne pathogens training. You're not if you're not trained on how to manage bloodborne uh, materials that would require bloodborne pathogen training. Leave it alone. Uh, report that to your supervisor. Let them know. Call that to their attention so that uh, you can get the appropriate training. Don't flush fats, oils, or grease. Um, you want to keep the fatty foods and meats out of the garbage disposal. Even if this is in your home environment, it's important to follow because what this does is it can get caught in the pea trap. It'll attract rodents and pests. It's going to clog the sewer system. And those, although they're liquid at first, as they go through the system and cool off, they will solidify. Um, so rather, you should solidify those, allow those to cool off, like for example, bacon grease. Once that cools down, it solidifies. You can wrap that up in a paper towel and throw it to the trash, throw that to the municipal solid waste. Um, and then liquid fat soils and grease, like vegetable oil or, or those kind of wastes that come from the kitchen environment, they can be recycled. So if you don't know where it goes, ask your manager. There should be a plan um, and, and a designated waste storage location uh, for that. What also doesn't belong in the trash? Um, hazardous chemicals don't belong in the trash. Batteries and electronics don't belong in the trash. Light bulbs, uh, many uh, types of light bulbs still contain mercury. In those, we want to take care not to, um, to break those. We want to put them in a rigid container and they should be stored in designated locations. Um, as well as sharks, you don't want to put broken glass, hypodermic needles, razors, anything that could potentially cut someone into the trash can. 
Instead, you'd want to put that in a rigid uh, glass disposal container. I want to point out that it's not your duty to sort through the trash or recycling, but it is your duty to appropriately manage your on-the-job created waste. If it's created when you're working with it, it is your responsibility to make sure it's handled and wasted appropriately. So don't put spill cleanup materials or the equipment into the trash. Those need to be disposed of as hazardous waste, even if it wasn't a hazardous chemical. Uh, recyclable materials like plastic, metals, and oils, those should be recycled. They shouldn't be sent to the trash. Automotive engine fluids, those can also be oil-based paints. Um, engine fluids can be recycled. Oil-based paints have to be disposed of as hazardous waste. These are um, hazardous once they go to the landfill environment. You can create landfill fires. Um, and again, they, will, they can track down who sent that. They do track down, they do fine, they do penalize. And what's worse is you don't want to create a landfill fire that results in the death of a landfill worker. And that does happen. Um, Latex-based latex paints, um, they are okay to go to the municipal solid waste as long as they don't contain toxic metals um, and as long as they're solidified. So again, we don't put liquids to the trash. And you can solidify those using cat litter sawdust or other equipment. Ultimately, what you want to do if you're evaluating your paint waste is, first of all, is it waste? Is it um, solid waste? What that means is, can we keep it out of the waste stream? Has the paint experienced freezer thaw cycles? That basically means it's not usable even if somebody wants to use it, so no, it's waste. Is there an expiration date on it, or do I not know the expiration date? I just found it in the closet. It looks like it's been sitting there for decades. Um, other things to consider, though, if it's not... Um, been damaged or expired, will the manufacturer actually accept that product? Can you send that back to them? Regardless of whether you're asking for a refund, uh, you may not get a refund from them, but you may still be able to send that back to them and they'll do some, um, they'll manage the waste side of that and that can help keep it out of our hazardous waste stream because we are limited on the amount of waste we can generate um, without an exceedance, um, without an extremely higher level of fees um, and the waste disposal expenses. Um, other things to consider is if there is a local paint stewardship program or a latex recycler near you, you can go to paintcare.org to identify if there's a, a local area that where they will recycle your latex paints. And there's also the industrial materials exchange program. This one isn't necessarily for uh, just paints, but you can use paints or other hazardous chemicals if you want to keep that, if it's still usable. It's kind of like a Craigslist, but for chemicals. Um, on the industrial level. And so there may be another organization out there that is interested in, in having and using that product even though you may no longer want it. Um, please include me in those conversations. Um, we should uh, be de uh, developing an appropriate bill of lading um, and contract for that. But these are some avenues to make sure that we keep this out of our waste stream. Um, and then, okay, so we've decided, no, it is waste, uh, but is it hazardous waste? And so, like I said, if it's oil-based paint, yes, it's hazardous. If it is, um, has toxic metals, primarily arsenic, barium, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, selenium, or silver, then it is toxic. Um, and so it must be disposed of as hazardous waste. And here's what you can do if you've identified the paint, um, the latex-based paint, it's non-hazardous, but you need to solidify it. Welcome. These are four easy steps on how to solidify your latex paint. You'll need a couple of tools in order to do this. A spatula for mixing, and a hand drill with a mixer on the end for large jobs. Open your can of latex and apply cat litter or assortment to the paint. Take a spatula or any kind of mixing object to solidify the paint and make it like an oatmeal So 
we'll let that set for about an hour. And moving on to the five gallon containers. Might need a, need a little bit more cat litter in those. Go in a circle like motion, like mixing a cake. and let's set for an hour. You can toss five gallons and even gallons in the garbage can with the lid off. Four easy steps. Thank you. Okay, so that's how you can manage your non-hazardous paint wastes. Let's talk about um, broken sharps and glass and plastic. So it's important to note that glass explodes when it breaks. So in any case that you have a broken glass, you want to discard any uncovered food that's found in the area uh, the, of the breakage incident. I want you to do not handle glass uh, contaminated with blood unless you've been trained on the bloodborne pathogens. Training in order to handle broken glass, first of all, what I want you to do is gather your supplies and personal protective equipment. You want a rigid container for recycling of this glass. And this could be um, a rigid container here on the right hand side. You've got one that you'll commonly see in, see in like the science laboratory classes where broken glass is deposited into this cardboard box. Um, once that's full, it is fully, it's completely taped up and then that's recycled through the chemical department. And this is in a facilities type environment. Um, that can be taped up and because it's not um, chemical type glassware that goes to uh, the glass blower, um, that can go to the, just to the recycle bin. But what you want to make sure is that each of these containers, even if you home make the rigid container yourself, like in this bottom right hand um, case where somebody's utilized um, a cat litter box to recycle their home broken glass, you want to make sure that it's still labeled. Um, indicate that there is broken glass in that and then still tape and seal up that container so that it's not going to fall apart during the municipal waste collection process. What we need to do is make sure that we're labeling that to also um, communicate the hazard to um, our municipal workers. Make sure that we're not causing harm to the people that are uh, handling this. Once we go, once it goes off of our site, we're not going to be and out of sight, out of minder. We're going to take care of everybody in the supply chain that manages that material. So what I want you to do is gather your supplies and personal protective equipment, a broom or a dustpan, tongs, um, and you may want to use uh, leather gloves or safety glasses. You do want to use safety glasses in case of um, further breaking of the glass, uh, again, because glass explodes. And what you want to do is pick up the large pieces using the tongs um, and place those into the container. You can sweep up the small pieces with the broom or dustpan and place that in the container. And then sweep again in a larger uh, diameter from the break point. So I would say at least 10 feet out around the incident. Sweep that up and put that into um, the rigid container. Like I said, tape that up and, um, and dispose of that appropriately. Never put this in the trash compactor. Never put broken glass, even if it's large glass or rigid plastics into the trash compactor. You're just going to cause a bigger hazard. Um, there is requirements on hazardous waste accumulation areas. So when you generate hazardous waste as it goes to these areas, these are heavily regulated and controlled areas. I want you to make sure that you never leave hazardous waste or chemicals just at the door of this area. You have a responsibility as the waste generator to make sure that that is kept and maintained appropriately until it is moved to the waste 
uh, hazardous waste accumulation area. Um, so notify the appropriate authorities if you don't have um, if you don't have key to access to those, um, and they should collect those within three days. They must collect those within three days and transport to that area. Um, so do not just put it at the door of the area and hope that somebody's going to find it when they next access that space. Um, secure your waste and call facilities um, for for waste pickup if that's the case. Um, Okay, so I want to talk about the golden rule for hazardous waste. I want you to make sure at all times that your hazardous waste stream, you have only one container per waste stream. I don't want you to become combining waste. We want to make sure that we can categorize those appropriately. Use only collection drops that are rust free, segregate compatible, incompatible wastes. So just like how different chemicals are not compatible, if those chemicals go through into the waste stream, they are also not going to be compatible make sure that they're kept separately in the same way that we talked about in managing your GHS chemical hazards. You want to provide secondary containment for all your waste collection containers. And this secondary containment means that it is large enough to collect and contain 100% of the largest container. So if the largest container in that area breaks, it will be, um, it will be collected. Or if you have multiple containers in that secondary container unit, then it needs to be able to hold at least 10% if all of those containers had broken. Um, always keep the waste containers closed except for when you're adding or removing waste. Position the container so that the label is visible. Um, I, I don't wanna see a label that, a, a container that's been turned and the label is facing the wall, especially just as I enter the room, I should be able to just scan the space or as I look at the shelf or open the cabinet, I should just be able to scan the space and immediately know what is there. You wanna provide the waste labels on all waste containers and those labels must specifically contain the words hazardous waste. They must identify what the hazard is and they must have the accumulation start date on it. If you have a waste drum that's um, gradually being filled by a waste process, um, then that doesn't necessarily need the accumulation start date. But if you have, for example, a, a cardboard bin that is a rigid container collecting light bulbs and that is waiting to be filled once it's full, we'll send it away. Then the first time a light bulb goes into that bin, you must write the start date on it. You must write the date of that um, because these containers cannot be stored for longer than 180 days. Never fill a waste container more than 90%. Let's go back to that rule. A container is full at, three, at 75%. Three quarters full of the container, consider it, close it off, get a new container. Um, I don't want to ever see more than 90% full because that's again going to be a big chemical hazard. You can call your facilities office or call myself to get transport to the accumulation area as it gets, as it reaches that point. So your hazardous waste labels, like we said, it has to contain the word hazardous waste. It has to describe the process that generated it. Um, so an example would be in the biology lab when they have dissection specimens. All of those specimens go into, say, a 55 gallon drum. That drum should say hazardous waste. It should say um, biological specimens waste. Um, and then it needs to indicate the hazards. In that case, the hazard is toxic and it's being collected as hazardous waste because it's a Washington state toxic. Um, you also want to include the owner, whose it is, so biology department, um, and the, the filler or start date, especially if it's a large 55 gallon drum. Uh, all large containers, and I'm gonna say in general, anything larger than a gallon, I want to see the lettering on that label must be a half inch tall. It must be large enough to read from distance. So here's an example of a universal waste storage area. This is a hazardous waste area and it must be maintained uh, in a certain way in spite of the fact that we're recycling these things. Um, all light bulbs, all electronics, all batteries should, must be closed in a, in a container, a rigid container that has a lid. Um, if I don't want to see this cardboard bin cylinder with the lid just slightly propped off or open, that will actually be a fine, a very expensive, on the order of thousands of dollars, uh, up to 30000 fine if we repeatedly um, receive violations for that and I do believe in general I'd say all of our campuses have already had violations noted on them. Each of these bins must contain the word universal waste and that is for waste from 
spent waste materials from waste light bulbs, um, batteries, like I said. So it must contain the word universal waste. It, it must indicate what's in it. it. Must have the accumulation start date, whose it is, etc. So let's talk a little bit more about chemical spill incidents. What happens if you open a closet and you find a drum that's, um, or you enter a room and you find a drum that's spilled over like this example here? First of all, I want you to know that um, if there is any serious emergency situation, the first person that you should call is 911. Um, if it's, if the emergent situation is contained, then you want to notify myself. Um, I want an immediate notification though, in particular, not just an um, incident accident report. If somebody has been exposed to a chemical, if a drain has been breached, if you are not trained on that chemical, or if the spill is larger than a gallon, or roughly if it's larger than a milk jug, then I want you to immediately notify me. Um, especially, there are rules on if the environmental, if the environment is exposed. We have to notify a number of agencies, and we have a time limit on that as well. Um, so don't wait two or three days to let me know so that I can notify the authorities. We'll already be in violation. And again, this is going to be thousands of dollars penalty um, if not followed. So notify uh, EHNS at extension 5522 if the environment has been breached. So first of all, when there's a chemical spill, I think... I failed to mention, let's go back to this picture. If you see a chemical spill like this, these are too large to... Oh, here we go. Okay, so that's what I'm looking for. I'm just getting ahead of myself. Your first response when you have a chemical spill, you want to alert, alert the surrounding personnel. You want to remove the contaminated clothing and PPE. And if you are exposed, utilize the emergency eyewash and shower station unit like we've discussed before. If it is safe to do so, I want you to use a dike um, to block the door or a drain and then notify uh, EHNS. So that's your initial response. Next thing I want you to do when you're preparing to clean up a chemical spill. First of all, let's talk about whose responsibility it is to clean up a chemical spill. The individual who spilled the chemical. First, it's your responsibility to clean that up. But there may be a situation where that individual is rushing off to the hospital. Um, they might not be immediately available. So in that case, um, that the individual who caused the chemical spill is not available, then their, their area or supervisor, area manager or supervisor is responsible for um, to ensuring that that chemical spill is cleaned up. They may, be, may potentially designate a responsible person, um, like a coworker, uh, to clean up that spill. If these people aren't available. It is the responsibility of the department to ensure that, um, let me say that again. If these people are not available, it is not the responsibility of facilities and it isn't uh, the custodial department. It is not the responsibility of security to come and clean that up. Um, but you will, in many cases, need to notify security that they can help in and give support in, um, in this process. Um, and it's important to note though that it is a department's responsibility is having and using the chemicals to make sure that you have adequate spill response materials, adequate personal protective equipment available, not only for working with the chemical, but if a chemical uh, spill occurs, you may need extra PPE um, and making sure that the chemicals are being stored and used properly. It is not my responsibility to make sure you manage your chemicals appropriately. I will give you the knowledge I'll give you um, the feedback, and I am that consulting type resource source to you, but ultimately it is your work, it is your responsibility. And so when a chemical spill happens, unless otherwise directed by myself, custodial staff will, or security officers will not be cleaning up the chemical spills. Um, and like we said, security may uh, be available to assist in the spill and evacuate, evacuating the emergency response protocols. The other thing that I want you to note Here's an example that this is a spill emergency. This is not um, a chemical spill incident that you are adequately trained or prepared to clean up and respond to. If you have a spill of this magnitude, um, 
we can call our emergency spill response team. So if you have this incident, evacuate the space and notify me immediately. So if you have a spill incident though, this would be an incident that you have low risk to exposing people or the environment. You have little to no potential for fire explosion. And if this spill is contained or if it's less than five gallons, then you should be equipped after our discussion today to clean up these spills. Um, you wanna make sure the spill will not contact a drain or soil and that the chemical can be safely cleaned using the PPE that is available to you. If you don't have appropriate PPE, if you don't have appropriate materials, then again, this becomes an emergency spill incident, not um, an emergency spill, not an incidental spill. And I want to make a point that if this is a case where you think you need a respirator as PPE, then this is not a small chemical spill. Do not attempt to clean that up. In that case, uh, it is a spill emergency, you're not trained. And so reach out to, again, evacuate the area, reach out to uh, health and safety. So before you attempt to clean up a spill, I want you to assess the spill. Is there potential for it to spread to areas of the drain? Is there potential to be exposed in gr to groups of people? Um, this decision tree I'm going to provide to you um, in the notes after this discussion. Um, assuming that you've sent requests for that certificate, you also received um, safety operating procedures where we'll go over this, where that will go over this. Make sure that there's potential, there's not potential for incompatible materials to combine. So if one chemical spilled, broke and spilled on the floor and now that spill is traveling to another location where there's another chemical that um, may potentially explode when reacted. Um, is it an unidentified chemical? If, it's, if you don't know what that chemical is, don't attempt to clean it up. It is a spill emergency. It is not a spill incident. Um, and again, if it's larger than a gallon of milk, then um, I need to be notified. I want to be notified immediately. If it's larger than five gallons, then it's an emergency. Don't attempt to clean it up. Are you trained on that chemical and do you feel confident with your ability to clean that up? If you don't, don't attempt to clean it up. Contact uh, Safety and Security for their assistance in evacuating the uh, response plan. Um, gather cleanup supplies if you do feel comfortable with cleaning it up. First of all, I want you to review your safety data sheets, put on your personal, personal protective equipment before you start cleaning. So here's an example of an emergency spill kit and what you should expect to see inside. Typically there is a broom and dustpan. These brooms are likely polypropylene uh, bristles where they're not going to melt and react to uh, certain chemicals uh, used during the cleanup process. Plastic bags and waste containers, hazardous waste labels should be provided in them. And then there should be absorbent material. Typically, you'll see this as either cat lid or sawdust, absorbent booms or pads, um, even activated carbon, which would be used for uh, volatile chemical situations. So like if it's stored in areas where gasoline is used. Um, and then a neutralization materials. This is for decontaminating. So if an acid spill occurs, um, the neutralizing material would be baking soda which is going to neutralize the acid and serve as absorbent material. Basic spills, examples of neutralizing would be a powdered citric acid. I think there are some laboratories across campuses that have planned to use a liquid um, acetic acid type mixture and that is not recommended because it's increasing the volume size of the spill. Um, I recognize that that's from previous planning so moving forward in restocking any future kits, I do not want you to use a liquid. I want you to use um, absorbent type, so like a powdered citric acid uh, type a neutralizing agent that you can kill two birds with one stone. Um, for oxidizers, and this is probably most relevant in more of the chemistry environments, chemistry lab environments, you want to use a sodium bisulfate or ferrous sulfate or sodium thiosulfate as a neutralizing agent for the oxidizers. And you can also use bleach for um, the neutralizing agent of thiols, reducers, organic sulfides, and recaptains, or biological materials. If you're not familiar with these last two bullets, don't clean up the material. Don't work with this. Okay, so before you start the cleanup, though, I, what I want you to do is designate safety zones. And I want you, want you to do is, um, we'll have three zones. You have where the spill is, that says black dot, and then you have the hot zone. This is the red um, area that completely encompasses around uh, the spill area. This is where cleanup is being performed. 
Outside of that zone, you have the decontamination zone. This is where equipment and supplies are going to be decontaminated. Nothing leaves this zone before it's been decontaminated, and no one enters this zone without having personal protective equipment on it. Also, no one leaves this zone without decontaminating and removing their personal protective equipment. So you may sometimes consider the, this decontamination zone the room that this has occurred in. And so no one leaves that room and goes into the hallway without removing their personal protective equipment um, and without being decontaminated. We don't want to travel and carry anything that may have gotten on the individual during this um, cleanup activity. And the classic example that's happened in the past would be for a mercury spill cleanup, um, where somebody attempted to clean up a mercury spill, it got contaminated on their shoes in the hot zone, uh, did not appropriately decontaminate, um, and then traveled out into the support zone and just spread the, uh, spread the material, spread the hazard, caused a lot larger, much more expensive, and much more hazardous um, situation. So designate your zones. And in the support zone, this is where somebody that is helping is. I don't want two people to be in the hot zone. You don't need two people support. If the spill is so large you feel like you need two people, then it's too large. Um, call that emergency situation and call, uh, call my office in. Um, support zone is somebody that knows how to do this process, can help um, uh, be that guiding support. They're to stand by and provide extra equipment, extra supplies, give that support to the individual that's working in the hot zone. They could also be somebody that moves into the decontamination zone to help with the decontamination process. So, if a spill incident occurs, how would you clean up the spill appropriately? You place a bottle of chemical waste on the counter and step into the next room. Then you hear a loud crash. You return to find your bottle broken on the floor. Since you have user knowledge of the spilled material, you know that there is no significant hazards present and you have the appropriate training to clean up the spilled material. If you didn't have user knowledge of the spilled materials, you would want to consult a safety data sheet for proper spill cleanup procedures. Please contact eh and at 294-5359 if you don't feel comfortable addressing the spill on your own. First, retrieve a spill kit. Place an absorbent barrier around the spilled material. Use tongs to remove any broken glass from the liquid. If dry, remove the green waste tag from the broken bottle to keep for later use. Place any broken glass into the laboratory glass collection container. Slowly work from the outside in, placing floor dry onto the spilled material. Wait a few minutes, allowing the spilled chemicals to absorb. Slowly mix the floor dry and sweep up the material. Put the used floor dry into a plastic bag. Attach the green label removed from the broken bottle to the bag of cleanup material and label as spill cleanup material. That's your waste label. Once finished, contact your lab supervisor and environmental health and safety as needed. Restock the spill kit for future uses. So if this was an acid spill or a base spill, what we want to do is ensure appropriate decontamination has, appropriate neutralization has occurred. And so once you've cleaned up in that manner, you want to then take um, some rinse water 
and wet that surface again. Give that a minute and check it with the pH strip. And so here's an example of a pH strip. What you do is you would dip that in the rinse water and wait a minute or two, um, and then compare the colors to this, um, this table. And so if you match up the colors to what we see on this table, it looks like the pH is between three and four. And what you want to do is make sure that the pH is um, above two and below 10. And, and that way it would, you've effectively neutralized the spill um, to, a, to a lesser hazard. Um, so if you put down that rinse water and you pH test stripped it and it is still down, at, say it's, you measured it at one, the pH one, then you want to repeat that process. Use the acid neutralization, absorbent material, and clean it up again just like you did uh, if, as if it was the original spill puddle and then check it again. Lay down rinse water in that area, pH test, strip the rinse water. If it is now above the pH value of two, then you can consider it done, just dry up that water and, and, um, and rinse away the, the area. If not, repeat the process again until you get it within the safe pH range. Okay, so all spill incidents, um, all waste material from a chemical spill incident is considered, ha considered hazardous waste. Um, so this label now from those waste materials must be, again, contain the word hazardous waste. You must have a date on it. Give your name and your contact information on that label um, and then make sure it's GHS compliant in terms of that we know what was the chemical that was spilt in that, in that waste. And then provide that to your manager or contact facilities or myself to arrange for pickup uh, and appropriate storage in the hazardous waste accumulation area. Um, safety alert. Never work with a chemical without proper training on that chemical. So you've been given this general hazard communication training. Also on your specific job site, your supervisors and managers are responsible for making sure that you have been trained and know the hazards about the specific chemicals that you are working with. If you've not had that, go seek out the safety data sheet, review, review through that familiarize yourself with um, how to appropriately work with that chemical. Read labels, read safety data sheets, and raise that to the attention of your supervisor. When you're cleaning up the spill, uh, again, maintain those cleanup zones that we talked about. Do not step over or walk through any contaminated areas, even if it's at the phase where we've dried it up and we're just checking um, for the neutralization effect. Don't, don't step over or walk through those. Always sweep or scoop towards the center of the spill, never towards your body or towards another individual. And remember to file an accident report for all chemical spills. Okay, here's another discussion about not only how to clean up a, a chemical spill, but how bad can it go, especially in a school environment, and um, some of the preventive measures that we can take uh, beforehand to make sure that we're prepared if, when a chemical spill happens. Spill control. Let's talk about the difference between you, a science teacher at a middle school or high school, and the industrial chemist. Now the industrial chemist, if he has a spill or an event, he can call his own hazmat team. Does your school have a hazmat team? I don't think so. The industrial chemist is working in a lab with other trained professionals. And they don't certainly have 24 kids in the lab that sometimes break the rules. There's a giant difference between the industrial research chemist and you. So what we need to do is talk about spill control and come up with a safety device that allows you to be able to contain and control any kind of spill take care of injuries, make sure the kids are safe, make sure that you're safe, but that doesn't break the budget. Before we build our, our homemade spill control center, I want to tell you a story. And again, remember this is a reenactment. The teacher had been teaching at a high school for a number of years. He was a trained, experienced chemistry teacher. He had no chemical storage room, so he needed some nitric acid for an activity that the students were doing, and his nitric acid was along the wall over here. So he went to his acid cabinet, and the bottle was stuck to the shelf. Now, how long does it take for a bottle to be stuck to the shelf? He's pulling and tugging, pulling and tugging. Finally, it comes free. He's carrying the acid bottle like he's walking a dog. Now, what could happen? It could get banged. It could be damaged. But what happened was the jug handle fell off. It falls to the floor, breaks, and acid on his shoes, socks, and pants. He has no eye wash. He has no safety shower. He climbs up to the lab bench. And as he's, as he's sitting on the lab bench, putting his feet into the sink, he's taking with cupped hands and putting it on his... Finally, he takes his shoes, socks, and pants off and starts to treat himself. Now. 
has he lost responsibility for any of those kids? And the answer is no. He's in a horrible way. But if those kids come up and running and try to help him, he's still responsible for them. And if those kids get injured, it's his fault. Now, I wish that was the end of the story, but it's not. The acid spill, because it was an older school, started to move this way. And when acid hits a tile floor, it gets very, very scummy. He finally gets down, and his feet hit the floor, and he, and he hits the scummy acid floor, and he slips and falls back into the acid. Now, as he's laying there in his underwear, has he lost control of the students? And the answer is no. He still has responsibility for these kids. Even though he's got acid on his shoes, socks, and pants, and on his legs, he still has responsibility for these kids. It's a horrible story, but I will tell you that when this teacher told me about this story, one thing he wanted to know for sure is that I always told this in any safety workshop that I did so that it would never, ever happen to another high school chemistry or biology teacher. So with that said, let's build um, a very inexpensive spill control center. And this is what I want you to buy. Three empty five-gallon pails. I want you to buy a 50-pound bag of unodorized kitty litter or oil dry. Now, you can buy that at a pet supply store or at any automotive supply store. I want you to buy some dry, clean sand. Now, it's really critical that the sand be nice and dry and clean because we're going to dump this on some reactive chemicals and we don't want to see any kind of reaction. Then last but not least, I want you to get 50 pounds of sodium carbonate anhydrous, which is going to neutralize any acid spill that we have on the floor. So what does the oil dry do? It's an absorbent. What does the sand do? It contains and controls. And what does the soda ash or sodium carbonate do? It neutralizes the spill. By the way, where do you get sodium carbonate? Well, certainly you can buy it from Flynn, already prepackaged in, in five-gallon pails, or you can go to any company that sells industrial chemicals and ask them if you can buy a 50-pound bag of sodium carbonate anhydrous, also known as soda ash. What else do we want? We want some saran wrap. We want a plastic broom and a plastic dustpan. We want some heavy-duty trash bags, and we want some extra-large rubber bands. Now, you might think, this is kind of wacky and crazy. Well, I got news for you, it is. But guess what? It really works. OK, what do we do? Bucket number one, kitty litter. But what we do is we take saran wrap, we put it over the top, and we put a rubber band around it. Why? Because we want to be able to get that top off right away. And what it allows us to do is make sure that our contents are there, because we can see it. But then guess what? The kids don't use it as a garbage can. They're not dumping their trash in there because we have this little barrier. And the rubber band allows us to keep the saran wrap in place. And oh, by the way, the saran wrap also keeps out humidity and moisture, which will protect the shelf life of your sodium carbonate and hydrous. Bucket number two, we put the sand. Bucket number three, we put the sodium carbonate and hydrous. So we have our spill control system of oil dry, which is an absorbent, sand containing control, and then our last bucket, sodium carbonate, which is our neutralizer. OK, so let's demonstrate this. As you can see, I'm just going to put this right here. As you can see, we have our fake spill. It's not a real spill. It's a, it's a dramatization. And I have it on my shoes, socks, and pants. Now, what I could do is come over to the safety shower and turn the shower on, which would be really nice. Or I could use the body drench to be able to get the chemical off me. Or certainly, and I think that this teacher would have wished he had one of these, again, if you don't have any of these and you're looking for a temporary solution, you jam this up the serrated hose connection, and now you have a body drench or a shower. You shouldn't have to climb up onto the sink and with cupped hands put water on yourself or run to a boy's washroom with cupped hands and try to get off the acid or the chemical. Okay, we have a spill. Now, if I have no spill control, what are we going to use? Well, if you watched the earlier segment, we could use a fire blanket. Again, a fire blanket is wonderful because it contains and controls the spill. But I've got my spill control center. And so what do I do? And I'm not going to actually do it because it's going to create a mess. But what I can do is I grab my kitty litter and I go around the spill and into the spill and kind of creating a little vortex effect. What you do not want to do is just go like this. Why? Because you're going to lose everything from the bucket. It's going to miss the spill because you're not that good of a name. And it's going to splatter the spill. So now you got a bunch of little spills. So you go around the spill and into the spill. Now, what works really good, too, and again, depending on the size and the effort that you got, you can get down here and get a scoop and go around the spill and into the spill. OK? Now, again, the kitty litter does what? Good. It absorbs. I grab my bucket of sand around the spill and into the spill. What does the sand do? Contains and controls. Now, if I drop the bottle of ammonium hydroxide, that ammonia smell is going to knock you off your feet. The sand going around the spill and in the spill will keep that vapor down. Now, if it's an acid spill, what do I do? I grab my bucket of sodium carbonate, I come over here, and I go around the spill and into the spill. There's enough moles of neutralizer in this sodium carbonate to neutralize the largest bottle that you have on your shelf of sulfuric acid. You can buy spill control kits from other companies, and they'll send you cute little envelopes, and you can read the directions. But you know what? Murphy's Law says that you're going to break the biggest bottle on your shelf, which means you've got to have the biggest spill control to neutralize every bottle or multiple bottles. Sand, kitty litter, absorbent, it all works really, really well. 
Okay, I want to do one more demonstration. We want to make sure that we see this bottle dropping to the floor. This bottle is labeled nitric acid. Are you ready? Wow, look at that. Now, by the way, that bottle is labeled nitric acid. It has water in it, okay? I'm not foolish enough to drop nitric acid in my own building. But this is what I want to show you. Can you see the broken glass? Look at that. I can. That's the beauty of a PVC coated bottle. Let's do it one more time. Wow, okay, a little bit of water leaking, but as you can see, you gotta be careful of glass shards. Look at that. Is that not fabulous? Is that not absolutely fabulous? Wow. Here's the moral of the story. Is it worth $3 more to buy your acids and bases in a PVC coated bottle? So when you drop that bottle, instead of having acid on your shoes, socks, and pants, you simply can treat the tiny little spill that's there, be able to move the material to an empty bucket where it's contained and controlled and allows you to neutralize this with no danger to you or your students. PVC coated bottles, they are absolute lifesavers. And again, all of this probably costs in the neighborhood of 50 to $60. But again, it gives you total flexibility about treating any size spill that you might have in your laboratory. It's really critical that you have the proper spill control materials on your shelf and you should have in your chemical storage area and in the laboratory. And you should practice it. Spill some water on the floor and get used to shaking some kitty litter or, or, or the oil dry onto the spill or using a scoop. Practice this and I guess what? When this event occurs, you're gonna be an expert, it's gonna be taken care of, and everyone's gonna be safe, be able to go home and, um, and be safe. Thank you. So um, we also need to bring up a point about water spills um, because they do also demand immediate response and attention because of the level of collateral damage that they can uh, potentially induce. So water spills are typically due to loose connections or breaks in lines and pipes, water condensers or cooling systems. If you find a water spill, what you should do is you should contain the spill using absorbent material or a temporary catchment like a bucket and then notify and immediately notify the facilities department. Um, it is the responsibilities of the facilities department to promptly repair the faulty equipment and to clean up the spill. All water spills must be cleaned up and the absorbent materials must be removed on the same day that the spill is discovered. If there is a case where the repair cannot be made in the same day of this discovery, then they can use a temporary catchment. Excuse me. Um, but that must be a short term duration and this is really only a case by case basis. Um, it is not acceptable to just um, use a catchment for a unit that you don't plan on or intend to uh, repair. Um, similarly, sorbent, pad, sorbent pads, um, especially around different types of shop equipment or, um, or machinery, these are not considered a temporary catchment device. A once full will immediately breach into a spill environment. Um, so they should only be used to collect up um, that small term spill uh, and then dispose of immediately cleaned up afterwards, immediately after use. Uh, so what's wrong with this picture? We have a waste uh, area for municipal. It looks like we have a recycling bin. If you look closer, there's actually paint buckets here. Um, they're probably, this latex, this is latex paint, paint once I look closer at it, but it's uh, probably not solidified just like the one that it doesn't have a lid on it. It's been thrown out about amongst these other bags. They are also unlabeled, um, unknown liquid. So Probably somebody just left another empty paint bucket here out in this collected rainwater, but we now don't know what that is and cannot just assume. We now have to treat this as hazardous waste and assume it's a hazardous chemical. Don't put us in that environment. Uh, empty buckets should be stored under cover, upside down, or um, with drainable holes as well. All chemicals and material, uh, metal-based products, if stored outside, need to be stored under cover. Here's an example of, I think in the bucket on the right, left-hand side, you've got metal um, uh, parts that are likely being used, so they're just storing it in a bucket. If this is being left outside, um, drill drain holes in the bottom, so it's not collecting rainwater, but in particular, that rainwater shouldn't be forced to travel through the exposed metal and um, actually pick up and leach metal from that and then go poison the storm water and poison fish um, with toxic metals. And on the right hand side, you've got the case where it looks like it's some kind of brick material, but it's been collecting up the rainwater. And again, we don't want to be contaminating that rainwater. Um, keep it covered and keep it um, 
or keep it so it's not going to collect away in water. So what's wrong with this picture? Uh, this one's kind of um, this is the case where they're sweeping from the inside out. Don't sweep. Uh, you want to sweep from the outside in. Um, here's an example of a electrical hazard environment where we talked about making sure you have the three feet emergency aisle access to all electrical equipment. Um, so, so we're talking about safety hazards. There is also an electrical hazard symbols um, that should be marked throughout the areas of your of your workspace. These areas, they must have a three feet clearance to all exits, all aisle spaces and emergency equipment and pull equipment. Um, they must be clearly marked to indicate that they are equipment um, circuits. And um, I think we, we talked about that already. They do need to, these panels must be kept closed and locked if necessary, if people are getting into them or if they are constantly being left open and all electrical panel equipment must have a ground intact. So this is something that I'll be looking for, uh, that Michelle Vallant, our occupational health and safety manager, will be looking for um, and flag out as a violation if we see that. But don't make me come around to find this and cause the hazard because it's a hazard in your work environment. Um, you wanna keep yourself protected. Here's an example of uh, one of those um, lamp disposal, universal waste disposal bins where the lid's been kept off. You've got a whole roll of these bins where not a single lid is on those. And on the right hand side of the picture, this is another custodial closet where I found um, new fluorescent light bulbs. This is not the appropriate place where waste bulbs are supposed to be stored and they've actually now mixed um, burnt out waste bulbs in with brand new light bulbs. And um, again, if an inspector finds this is a violation, let alone the opportunity, let alone providing the opportunity for in an earthquake, this to fall and break and create a mercury spill in now that work environment. So no lid, no lid. Make sure that those bins are labeled universal waste. When was the accumulation start date? And what is the contents? Is it batteries? Is it lamps? Um, is it hazardous chemicals? What is the hazard? Pay attention to the signs in this left-hand side picture you have somebody's clearly marked that this space needs to be kept clear. And instead you've got a whole bunch of debris and trip hazards. Um, you've got a bunch of poles lined up, um, long, uh, let's just call them lever type objects stacked up in that corner. And if there's an earthquake, that's gonna come down and act like a hammer with full force of the, of the head of the hammer to potentially strike and kill someone if that falls. Um, so those should either be stored uh, on their horizontal end, lying down so they won't fall, or they need to be gated up, racked up with chains um, and shelving. And on the right-hand side, if you look at what's wrong with this picture, this is a pile up of school desks and chairs and waste units. I think there's even a, an undismantled drinking fountain, just pile of junk. And it's right in front of a pallet of four 55 gallon drums of toxic chemical. Um, this is a, a big <laughs> hazard problem. Okay, what's wrong with these pictures on the left hand side to keep moving quickly? Um, if you look closely, this chemical product is stored on top of precariously stored on an object. I think what was happening was they were actually gluing down the object so they're holding something heavy to keep it in place until the glue dries. But they chose to use a chemical product as a weight. That's not appropriate use of it. And you pay attention, if you look closely, it's acetone. It's a highly flammable and volatile chemical. If this spills from this precarious arrangement, lands on the floor and blasts open, you've now created a volatile atmosphere. Um, on the right hand side, you've got an electrical hazard where the plate is not protect, um, not installed properly on the electrical outlet. There's also, it's not a three-pronged grounded um, plug. And on the right-hand side, you've got right next to somebody's lunch or bread for making lunch um, stored next to a, when you look closely, that's a carcinogenic uh, toxic chemical. And you're just putting that right with um, your lunch. So here's another couple of hazards in this picture. You've got on um, these 55 gallon drums on top of these storage pallets. This is not the way it's supposed to be stored. Again, don't store chemicals higher than three feet. 
These bins are, these drums are actually empty, but they previously held corrosive chemical that you can see uh, in the labels. Remember, if it's an empty container, you need to completely deface the label. A big 55 gallon plastic drum like this, if you check the SCS sheet and the container is not considered hazardous waste, then you can rinse that chemical through, uh, rinse that container three times. The way to do that is to fill the container three, uh, 25% full, rinse it and dump it, fill it 25% full again, and do that three times. And then if it's a 55 gallon um, unit like this, these can be cut in half and then uh, disposed of in the municipal solid waste um, system. Or if it can be recycled, that would be the first uh, thing to note. If it's a hazardous waste, um, a hazardous, if the container is hazardous waste, then that should be in the hazardous waste accumulation area. Um, and then another point to make with the pallets. The pallets uh, are also a trip and fall hazard. They should be stored in stacks, like what you see on the left-hand side, but these three that are stored standing up are highly likely to fall and cause um, hazards, so they shouldn't be stored that way. What's wrong with this picture? Anybody want to volunteer this one? This is a hazardous waste accumulation area. I've got two 55 gallon drums stored on a secondary containment and then behind it there's that yellow drum that's actually a spill kit. Um, from open access I cannot clearly see the label. I have to walk completely around the drums and this label is actually pinned between the two drums. The marks that it contains flammable liquid and it is hazardous waste but I don't know whose it is. I don't know when it started. I don't know what kind of waste it is. All I know is it's flammable hazardous waste. Um, so realistically, this is just um, oil-based paint. And so it would be a combustible um, hazardous waste that can be simply uh, recycled or um, disposed of. Um, we're almost there. Here's another example that I don't want to see when I walk about campuses and you should keep an eye about as well in your work environment. On the left hand side is a cart it is actually in a parking garage space and you've got several hazardous um, pesticide type chemicals um, being used there. This cart was actually left unsupervised uh, for up to 10 minutes. I, was, I stood there waiting to see when whoever is using this unit um, comes back. Uh, presumably, we'll just give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they went to their lunch break. Um, but they are not in direct supervision of these chemicals. They should be, if they're hazardous, locked up and away from direct access from the public. Um, so, and on the right hand side, this is somebody decided to store, um, this was floor wax product when they're resealing the floors. So they've got a bucket of that and a mop and they want to come back and use it so they decided to hide it in a larger trash can and use that as secondary containment but no this is still not appropriate this isn't doesn't have a lid it's not appropriately labeled and how do i know how to protect myself from that if i happen upon it in this example we have the first picture might be a little you might be a little too used to this site but it's kind of becoming a pet peeve of mine and i really don't want to see it anymore because this um, um, wet floor sign is we've had too much of a problem that we are all desensitized to it. We don't even notice when it's out and be and necessary. It is a HASCOM cautionary sign and it needs to be recognized and given the reverence that it deserves when it is being used. And so when it's not being used, it needs to be put away and um, but it's also now being stored up against the wall where it is a trip hazard for several emergency units, including the fire blanket, the emergency eye wash and shower station. Um, on the right hand side, the, you can see there's actually another um, wet floor sign that's being stored in this uh, stairwell. And in the stairwell, somebody's got uh, a bicycle being stored in that. This is emergency fire uh, exit access stairwell. It's also being cluttered with a location that somebody decided to store their ladder. These ladders, just like those long poles that we looked at in the last um, picture, can be a lever action hazard. If that falls, it can hit someone with enough force to kill them. And so 
Ladders should always be stored again on their sides or hang, hung up or uh, chained up and gained up, gated off so that they won't fall, especially in the event of an earthquake. But in the event of an earthquake or a fire situation, and we've got the entire contents of the building flooding out through this emergency exit, and now they're going to be gated up and trapped amongst a ladder. Not appropriate. There are some other things that you need to be trained on if you're working with heavy duty energized equipment at any time that, um, that something needs to be repaired or managed on that unit. I don't have enough time to go into those details here, but enough to flag out right now. If you work on heavy duty equipment, energized equipment, uh, make sure to call to your attention if you have not been appropriately trained on lockout tagout procedures call that to your supervisor's attention and let's get a training session and get you up to speed on those the other things i want you to make sure to do is never enter confined space with what you may find on campus confined space entry is forbidden um, without a written permit from the, uh, the from the government we have to request for each specific incident so even if you were given permission to go into a tunnel or a hole or any type of confined space before, you don't have permission again. You have to go back through that same confined space permit process. And this is to protect you. There may potentially be an atmosphere, a breathing atmosphere in those that can kill you within minutes. And we have had, um, across the country, every year it happens, that worker after worker will go into a space and the other worker waiting outside says, hmm, what happened to them? Why aren't they back? They go in to check on it. Another worker outside says, hmm, what happened to them? Why aren't they back? Up to seven people have gone into a space like that. And nobody alerted and wondered why hasn't anybody else come back? And all of them gone in and died. And this type of story is not a one-time incident. Do not enter confined space without permission, written permission. Um, never climb on or stand above a dumpster. That can also be considered a confined space and a gulf hazard. If you climb into a dumpster, um, those are large enough to collect enough materials that those could avalanche onto you and, uh, and be very harmful. As well, never reach into a trash compactor. Don't even um, put a, don't even use a stick or something into a trash compactor. Those are highly energized. Uh, mechanical objects would require the lockout tagout procedures before somebody um, would be even able to conduct repairs on those units. So what's wrong with this picture? We're almost there, guys. This fellow is standing on the highest rung of the ladder. Um, I want you to only stand, you never stand on the top two rungs of the ladder. There should also be a second partner on this type of ladder uh, to hold the ladder steady on the bottom unit. Um, so we're not really giving you official ladder safety training right now. You can again call that to the attention of your supervisor, but I want to call out the hazards to you. Um, you should never work with a wooden ladder. The problem with wooden ladders are that they have grains, grain patterns in them that camouflage and hide any cracks um, or uh, failures that would impair the ability to, for the ladder to function, uh, hold your weight and work appropriately. Don't repair a ladder dispose of the ladder. Um, don't use duct tape. So this picture here is actually a ladder that I had to throw a fit with when I found in my own backyard that somebody has duct taped and drilled and um, any way that you could um, rig up a ladder inappropriately, they have done it. And then they're still working on this. Ladders like this mean death by impalement. Do not use a wooden ladder. Um, that ladder that very night went straight into our campfire. <laughs> so safety is a thought process. Be thoughtful, be safe. And so now as we're coming to the end of our session today, I want to uh, point out again, it's hard to monitor full attendance here through the Zoom session. So we did have um, a point at the beginning of the session to make sure that you were able to get in early enough to receive these materials discussed. I also want to make sure that you stayed for the full session so to call to your attention now in order to receive certificate of completion not only do you need to send that email we talked about earlier today that had a different password but i also want you to send another email that verifies that you stayed for the full session in that email use the password hascom and again uh, tell me your name your department and which campus you belong to so that we can get those um, 
certificates to you. I can give you the notes and handouts that I would typically do in a live session. And, uh, and we can get to documentation with the appropriate department that you work with. So, I am, um, my mouth is a marathon runner. That's probably the reason I don't like to run.